Well, this was this was just the near north side. It wasn't River North, and it was full of dilapidated buildings, buildings that most people had given up on, given up on because, for the most part, north of the river was a manufacturing district, light manufacturing, and um, businesses were moving to the suburbs at that time. Alcro Village, that was certainly prominent. That was out by O'Hare Field, but other areas. Uh, that made more sense, single-story buildings that were more efficient than having a multi-story building where you were going up and down. Uh, to that end, also you were seeing a generational change. The old mom-and-pop businesses, young people who were now getting college degrees, were coming of age, and this uh, big uh, baby boom generation was coming. They said they didn't want to be associated with what their parents were doing, and for that matter, it was typically rather a dirty, run-down neighborhood full of buildings that were dilapidated, that were uh, borderline ready for condemnation, and the rents couldn't support the economics. So as a consequence, what many people were forced to do was to tear those buildings down. It was cheaper to have a vacant lot and merely pay the real estate taxes, still losing money but less, than to keep an old building that was vacant up above the first floor, and on the ground floor had a business that maybe they paid their rent and maybe they didn't. So as a consequence, that was the uh, plight of the real estate stock in the neighborhood. Um, the AMA, which was one of the anchors for the neighborhood at the time, um, decided to position themselves to protect their area by merely buying buildings around them and tearing them down. So that's why you wound up seeing a lot of vacant parking lots. They were one of the largest landowners here at the time didn't mean they were redeveloping, they just felt that the best way to deal with urban blight was to demolish. And, and they did. Now ultimately, as a consequence, they really did clear the way for a lot of the new apartment buildings that came subsequent. The unintended consequence. Uh, what happened, however, with myself is I wound up um, buying a building that <coughs> some artists came to me, photographers came to me and said, look, we're looking for some alternative space. Uh, would you be interested in uh, leasing it to me? Most of them couldn't pay their rent either. I have the good fortune of having some of their artwork. Not saying that it has a whole lot of value today, but it has a lot of sentimentality for me. And Chicago at that time was the center of print advertising. And again, uh, decades go by, but we had Montgomery Wards, we had Sears, we had Spiegel. They were major producers of print ads. So we had a number of photographers, and of course with the photographers came modeling agencies. At the time, the art district was all off Michigan Avenue, East Ontario Street, and uh, it was pricey, relatively speaking, at the time. And there were a number of emerging galleries, and Chicago was trying to find its own footing, so we started giving space to some art dealers, art galleries, and brought the art gallery initially over to Hubbard Street, the art gallery district, and it did okay. Uh, things went along, but again, nothing was flourishing. We were just getting by. And yes, there were the uh, underbelly, the dark underbelly of the city with the prostitutes and the pimps and the drugs and the vagrancy and the homelessness and all the other sad parts of, of any urban environment, and they all seemed to be here. In fact, most people really knew what we now affectionately call River North as its old affectionate term, and that was Skid Row. So that's what you recall when you were here. Yeah. And it was. You're talking 70s then? Was it was the late, 70s. it was 60s through the early 70s. And uh, so I was struggling, and I recall one day talking to some friends who lived uh, in the suburbs, and they said, Boy, I feel for you. You got to go to work in that environment every day. It's a real urban jungle. And it was. There's absolutely no question. It was a tough go. It was a tough go because. Even the city didn't get it at the time because the city inspectors, and I guess they were right in their request, I said, look, this doesn't meet code, that doesn't meet code, you got to fix stuff. And we said, look, we can only do what we can do, we can't afford to do it, you're going to force us to demolish. Well, I persevered and we got through our first building. And sure enough, the neighbor who was adjacent to that property uh, called and said, look, my parents are retiring, they've got a luggage shop and they would like to know if you'd be interested in buying their building. We hear tell that you're buying property in the neighborhood and no one's buying property. They're only selling. I said, okay. Uh, I, I did buy it. I didn't have any bright ideas on what to do with that either. 
except one day I met Gordon Sinclair. Gordon Sinclair gave me an epiphany. He showed me what the neighborhood had the potential to be. And the potential was to bring restaurants of a high quality in. And people would go to areas that otherwise they would stay out of. In fact, they even found it rather engaging. And today you see that formula repeated over and over again. Um, so that, you know, you'll hear of someone taking a restaurant and say, wow, what kind of neighborhood? It kind of adds to the pizzazz in its own way that you were able to get in and out and have this great meal and get back. But Gordon did show me the way. That was the epiphany. Once Gordon showed me that you could actually bring people with disposable income to the neighborhood and have someone who have a viable business to pay rent, I said, now we've got something to work with. Well, from that, we got Richard Melman and Let Us Entertain You. And we go on and on and on with restaurants. We now have 32 restaurants. Wow. But the restaurants themselves couldn't be the catalyst on its own, there had to be other users. And now you had to come up with the ability to start filling up the upper floors and starting to market the neighborhood. So that's the time in those early 70s in which we changed the name because you couldn't keep calling it near north side. That, that's just this big area. And you certainly <coughs> couldn't keep calling it at Skid Row because if someone said, where are you at? Skid Row. It didn't work. And by the way, no one was living there. There were a few people illegally living in lofts at the time. So. The neighborhood name evolved to River North, put together a neighborhood organization called River North Association to start uh, promoting and promulgating the area. And we started coalescing as a neighborhood of sorts. There weren't many property owners who were prepared to step up at that time, but you were starting to see the uh, beginnings of an art district. You're beginning to see the makings of a restaurant entertainment area. And also, you were beginning to see people who were looking to live in lofts and alternative spaces. The city finally granted some dispensation for people to do that. And you were getting more creative types who were looking for alternative space. Still, you had the problem with all the underbelly of the area. And gentrification is an interesting issue. Keep in mind that there weren't resident, residential buildings as we think of. There were rooming houses. So that became an issue, too, for us. And personally, I wound up uh, being instrumental in taking the Lawson House Y and making that the largest SRO in the city. So that some of the buildings that we did redo, for example, where Maggiano's was at, was a rooming house. Those people got relocated there. Um, but beyond that, the classic gentrification of, of neighborhoods in which housing stock goes from being very affordable to being unaffordable and turns into condos. We didn't have that issue. Uh, frankly, it was mostly just commercial buildings. There wasn't any housing.